Would you open your Bibles, please, to Revelation chapter 5? Revelation chapter 5. Now, you may recall last week that we did Revelation chapter 4, the last part of it, and as you may know, Revelation chapter 4 can be one of the most frightening chapters in the Bible simply because of the description that's given of these mighty angels that are the, these archangels as it were that are around the throne of God. John as he's transported to heaven sees a throne in heaven. This is the first thing he sees which means it's the main thing in heaven. There's someone seated on the throne that looks like carnelian and jasper, two different red gemstones, semi-precious gemstones. And we showed you pictures of that. There's a green rainbow surrounding this throne that's emerald-like. And in front of the throne, you have a sea of glass, which is not the pavement. That's something described elsewhere in the Bible as looking like a sparkling sapphire. The sea of glass is a large cleansing basin that would have been in front of the temple originally or the tabernacle. It was made out of bronze, and in heaven it's made out of glass. It's pure, and it's there, and it's full of water, and for whatever purposes God has that for, which we talked about last time too. And then, of course, you have the sevenfold spirit of God, or the seven spirits of God, as your Bible may say, which is representative, uh, represented to us in the temple and the tabernacle by that menorah, like what we have behind me on the, on the, on the communion table back there. Uh, and it's just a picture of the Holy Spirit and his ministry, and more than that, in fact. But then in Revelation 4, John sees these four living creatures. If you have a Bible that calls them beasts, that's a very bad translation living creatures or living beings, because he didn't know how, what else to call them. They are so, so magnificent, huge, glorious, powerful, amazing. These are cherubim, and all they do is worship God day and night around the throne because they are, as John described them, covered with eyes. Now, that makes it sound like some sort of a terrible, scary monster, but they aren't. They're beautiful and overwhelmingly so, and the reason for the eyes, they see God all the time, and when they see him, all they want to do is worship. They're not wind-up dolls where God says, just do with your thing and worship me. That's what I created you for. Sure, we're created to worship God, but worship him intelligently by seeing him, by looking upon him. They see him, and the encouragement in there is that you see him, and therefore, you are amazed by him. Well, we see through that glass darkly, as we spent a lot of time talking about last week. We don't see a, a straight, clear view. We will someday. And I'm sure our response is going to be at least the same as those angels. We'll be down on our faces before the Lord and loving it. It's going to be totally amazing for all eternity. We'll be in his presence. But then there are these other guys that I saved till last, though they're mentioned first. Sitting on thrones around the throne of God, there are 24 elders. They're wearing white robes, they're wearing crowns, and they're sitting around the throne. We've talked about these guys before. The elders, who are 12 and 12, numbers were significant in the Bible because they were teaching tools, remember? 12 was a symbol to anybody reading the Bible or hearing the scripture read of a government or an administration that was ruled by God. Ten was a number that said it was a government or administration ruled by men when used in a context of administration. So you have 24, 12 and 12. That is believed to be, and I agree with this perspective, the 12 patriarchs of the Old Testament, the 12 apostles of the New Testament. These elders in this particular case represent the Old and the New Testament, the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, and all of that. I, if you don't understand what I'm saying, don't worry about that. We get to these things in time and, and just hold on to that. But to find out what the meaning behind these guys are, you have to ask the question, not what do they mean, but what do they do? And elders in the Bible and in ancient times everywhere were the, the community, as it were, respected men who were judges. And there were also indications, by the way, in case you're wondering, were there any women involved in this in the Bible? You find in the Old Testament occasionally a woman who is called a quote-unquote wise woman 
who pops up once in a while in the, in the Old Testament in certain narratives, who they seem to be a female form of elder who helps make wise decisions. Maybe they're an advisor to a king or to an elder or something like that. We're not really sure. But they are highly respected people, and they are also professional witnesses. So that when somebody needs uh, to make a transaction, like a covenant, uh, like a lawsuit or something, somebody has a, uh, to, uh, has a complaint against a neighbor and they take it to, say, we would take it to a judge or to court. You'd take it to an elder back then. And their decision was made final. And it was made in the presence of witnesses. Witnesses helped ratify any judgment. You the guy couldn't say behind closed doors, this is what I think. You had to have a lot of people hear that so that they know the guy actually said it. Because very little was put in writing in those days. Keep that in mind as well. So with all of that, you come to the end of chapter 5, and the, the angels and the elders are worshiping God on the throne. It's a magnificent scene, and we come to chapter 5. But there are no chapter numbers in the original text. This is a continuation. It's a long narrative, and on it goes. So let's read chapter 5 here. John says, Then I saw. So he's watching the scene in heaven with the elders and the angels and the Lord on the throne and all the magnificent things that tell us about him. And then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides. In other words, there's something on the inside, but there's something very obviously written on the outside as well and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice, whoever this is, who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll? What's that all about? John knew. And anybody who read this back in those days, they knew too. They understood exactly what this is. Well, what is it? I'll tell you in a minute. Ha ha. Who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll, the loud voice says from this angel. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, what's that all about? We're going to have to get to that another day because there's a really important explanation that comes into play in Revelation chapter 20. We have to get almost all the way to the end of the book. We'll spend a whole Sunday on that one. But no one was found on earth, under the earth, uh, in heaven that could open the scroll or even look inside it. No one was found to do this. What's going on there? That's very strange. John says, verse 4, I wept and wept because no one was found who was worthy. That's an important word, to open the scroll or look inside. Then one of the elders said to me, one of these 24 guys in their white robes and their crowns, said to me, do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. Who's that? Say it. Jesus. We know that. Those are terms for the Messiah. The lion of the tribe of Judah, said by, by Jacob in Genesis from Judah, this lion is going to be like a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah. That's a messianic term. The root of uh, David, that's David's... Uh, uh, descendant that comes from David. And so this is obviously Jesus. He was called son of David, not because he was David's son, but that because he was David's uh, descendant. And this, the lion of the tribe of Judah, has triumphed. It's Jesus. And he is able to open the scroll and it's seven seals. What's that for? What's it about? Well, verse 6. Then... John said, I saw a lamb. Where's the lion? It's the lamb. The lion is the lamb. The lamb is the lion. You say, well, you can't have both. My question to you is, why not? You do. You see, that's the way the Bible is written. You do have both. I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. What's that? Looking that as if it had been slain. We'll get to that. That's a very important point. You say, well, that's Jesus on the cross. No, it's not. Not quite. You'll see this in just a second. This isn't heresy, by the way. It's mind-blowingly wonderful. Standing at the center of the throne, the Lamb's on the throne, in the middle. That's God's throne. Guess what? Jesus is God. 
encircled by the four living creatures and the elders circling around on the outside. Here they are worshiping. And he had, this is a picture of Jesus that is very symbolic. Seven horns, seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. In other words, it is a very symbolic picture of Jesus. He is the lion of the tribe of Judah. He's the root of David. Uh, he is the lamb as if it had been slain, looking as if it had been slain. The horns, horns that are seven, it's a perfect authority. Horns were pictures of authority. I showed you a picture of that last week. I'm not going to do it again this week on the huge griffin-like statues that you can find all over Mesopotamia. They have horns on their crowns. They're not sticking out. They're wrapping around their, their crowns. So you can actually see them carved there. Look it up on the internet. You'll find it all over the place. And Jesus has seven of these, which is the perfect number, God's number, perfect authority, total authority, seven eyes. We'll all get to that one. What's that all about? Not scary. It's very interesting. And verse 7. He came and took the scroll from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and the 24 elders fell down before the Lamb. Oh, what a moment it is. He takes the scroll and the mightiest angels in heaven fall down in front of him in worship. And the elders fall down in front of him in worship. And each one had a harp. This is where we get the idea of angels with harps. That's an interesting picture. Each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals. They're singing this song to Jesus. Jesus is the object of the song. And it's a new song because it had never been sung before. This is a new thing that had been predicted in the Bible, foretold by God in Scripture, but now it's about to come to pass. John is seeing this. And they're singing this new song. You are worthy, they sing to Jesus, to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood, you purchased men for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. That is not just the Jews, folks. That is everyone who has ever encountered Jesus and taken faith by salvation through his saving faith. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. And then I looked, John said, and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. This is hundreds of millions of angels. And he hears the voice of all of these angels. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice, they sang. How about that? For a choir. A hundred million angels all singing, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. And then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Be praise and glory, honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures, these cherubim, said, Amen. And the elders fell down and worshipped. What is going on? It's really quite simple. If, if you've read the Old Testament, and more than that, if you paid attention to it. You know what you're looking at in this chapter? This is God pulling the trigger that fires the gun, so to speak, that starts the tribulation. That's how important this chapter is. This is what starts the ball rolling. The 70th week of Daniel, the last seven years of earth's history. How does it begin? Where does it begin? Why does it begin? It's all right here. You say, well, it begins with the rapture. I got news for you. The Bible never tells us that. I do believe the rapture will happen before that seven years kicks in or right as it does. 
But I have different ways of explaining that. We can get to that another day, but that's not for today. You know my position on it. However, the tribulation, when it begins, begins in chapter 5, right here. So let's take a look at this. First of all, let's go back to the beginning of the chapter. Then I saw in the right hand of him who sat on the throne a scroll with writing on both sides and sealed with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaiming in a loud voice who is worthy to break the seals and open the scroll. But no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth could open the scroll or even look inside it. And I wept and I wept because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or look inside. Okay, so here's the picture. John now sees in the hand of God on the throne this scroll. And the cry goes out, who can open this thing? It's got seven seals. There's writing on the outside. There's writing on the inside. That tells you what the scroll is. Who's worthy to open it? Why is this important? What's going on? Oh, it's a great mystery. No, it ain't. The problem of that scroll started in Genesis chapter 1 and Genesis chapter 3. If you have your Bible, open it. You should have your Bible. If you don't, you've been given one this morning, but it doesn't have Genesis in it. It's a New Testament. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, all the way at the beginning of the Bible, verse 26, then God said, let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them, man is the species here, male and female, let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock. Notice this phrase, and over all the earth. Rule over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. Okay, God makes humans, people. He makes the people, now I want you to catch this. This is part of the story. You've got to remember this. He makes the people in his image. In other words, we originally, as Adam and Eve, way back then when, when Adam and Eve were there, we as humans were made in the image of God. Not that we were an exact copy of him, but we were like him in so many ways. I wish I could go into that. That's a whole other sermon. But we were created in his image. We reflected all he was originally in the garden. We were not intended to die. We were intended to live forever. We were intended to have dominion over this world. We were intended to have dominion over the animals and every living thing on this world. This is what God made us. But we were not gods. We were people. Those who say we were created as gods are badly mistaken. We were created as people, but we were in a unique condition as we look back on it, that we are obviously no longer in. Conditions have changed. And created to rule over all the earth. And so, as God created man and woman to rule over all the earth, they begin this process. Well, verse 28, God said, this is again in Genesis, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number and fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Again, ruling over, having that authority over it. And then he goes on and he speaks about a few other things in verse 31. And God saw all that he had made. And it was, it wasn't just good. It was very good. When God makes a statement like that, pay attention. This was amazing back in those days. And there was evening and there was morning, the sixth day. Skip ahead now. Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. You know the story. Now, the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, the serpent, did God say? Isn't that how Satan gets people to sin? God lays it out in his word and Satan causes us to question it. What do you think is going on in this world today? 
What do you think's been going on in this world? What gives people the idea that I can reject God and live any way I want to, and unfortunately, they've also fill in a blank without consequences, both earthly and eternal. Satan's temptation is, did God really say? The answer should have been, yes, he said it, go away. <laughs> Didn't happen that way. So he said to the woman, did God really say, you must not eat from any tree in the garden? You know the story of the trees. The woman said to the serpent, we may eat the fruit from the trees of the garden, but God did say, you must not eat from the fruit of the, fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God. Wait a minute. They already are. Ah, suddenly things start to click. They are made in the image of God. So he lied to them and lied to them again. Like you're not there yet. They already were created in God's image. They were ruling over the earth. God put that, that whole responsibility, not only the responsibility, but the deed, so to speak, in their hand. Knowing good and evil. Well, verse 6, when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, I had a friend that once said it might have been chocolate coated, also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate, and then she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Of course, that again is a, I, there are so many sermons in this, folks, I, I'm, I'm just skipping over them, okay? And he ate it. And why, you know, she eats, she's tempted, and he hands it, she hands it to Adam, and oh, I'll eat it, you know. So, wow, okay, why did he do that? But he did. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Verse 8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid themselves from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the to man and said, Where are you? And he answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? And the man said, the woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit to the tree and I ate it. In other words, it was the woman you gave me. He removes himself three times from the problem. Isn't that just like making our excuses? You ladies are thinking, yeah, men do that. Hey, everybody does it, okay? Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? And the woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. That was true. So the Lord God said to the serpent, first he addresses the devil in the form of this serpent, whatever it looked like at the time. Because you have done this, cursed are you above the livestock and all the wild animals, you crawl on your belly, so forth and so on. Skip down to verse 16. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. Take that note too. This is a change. He will rule over you. That is the situation today, biblically speaking, and in life. In those days prior to this, what is called the fall of mankind, that wasn't the case. This is new. Hmm. To Adam, here we go. He said, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree, about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In other words, listen to me, cursed is the ground because of you. Here comes the problem. In other words, you will no longer have dominion over the earth. It will rule over you, and it will eventually kill you. What just happened? Satan tempted Eve. Adam fell in with her on this temptation to be like God, which they were already created in his image. They weren't gods, but they were created in his image. They had everything going for them. 
They ruled the world, as it were. They were given the world to rule. And they handed the deed back over to Satan. Well, not back. They handed it to him. You say, really? Yes. Turn in your Bible. We're going to do a lot of fanning of our faces today with Bible pages. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Luke chapter 4, verse 1. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, he'd just been baptized, returned from the Jordan where he was led by the Spirit into the desert where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. And he ate nothing during those 40 days, and at the end of them he was hungry. Of course, that's when your body starts to starve. Verse 3 of Luke chapter 4. The devil, the devil, the devil, said to Jesus, if you are the Son of God, if, here we go again, tell this stone to become bread. Well, you know the story. Jesus answered, it is written. It is written. Man does not live on bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. Verse 5, here it comes. The devil led him to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. This is a miraculous thing. The devil is not God. God is infinitely greater than the sum total of his creation of which the devil is only a very small part. But he is enormously powerful from our perspective for sure. And he takes Jesus to a high place, shows him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. That is a miracle. And he said to Jesus, I will give you all their authority and splendor, for it has been given to me, and I can give it to anyone I want to. So if you worship me, it will all be yours. Did you catch what the devil told Jesus? I own all of this. It was given to me. I'm the authority over all the world, and I can give this to whoever I want to. He holds a deed. He owns the world. Jesus answered, of course, got to complete it. It is written, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. He comes back at the devil. But we have to move on from that. In all the accounts of the temptation of Jesus, in Matthew and Luke and mentioned briefly in Mark, Jesus never disputed Satan's claim to have authority over all the earth. Satan is the father of lies. But don't forget that the most insidious lies are made up of half-truths. It is true that Satan does have the deed of the earth. Some people think that God is ruling over the world today. I have read the news, even this morning. I know God is in charge. But somebody else has a certain type of authority over this earth that God is allowing him to have by his will. And the world is a disaster and getting worse. Over in Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2. As for you, Paul told the Ephesians, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world, talking about before they became Christians, and followed the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. The ruler of the kingdom of the air. Paul affirms that Satan rules from a spiritual standpoint over this world. Yeah, God is in charge, but God lets him do it. Why? Man handed the deed over to Satan, back in the garden. Man defaulted on this deed. Over in John chapter 12, verse 23, Jesus replied, he's speaking to his guys there, just before the Last Supper, just before they went into the room to have a biblical dinner, the hour has come, you're supposed to laugh at that, but that's okay. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. I tell you the truth that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, he's talking about himself going to the cross. It remains only a single seed, but if it dies, it produces many seeds. And the man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it and find eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me. 
And where I am, my servant will be also. My father will also honor those who serve me. Now my heart is troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason that I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Jesus is praying. He appears to be outside the upper room. Then a voice came from heaven. I have glorified it, and I will glorify it again. This is God speaking from heaven. The crowd thought uh, that that was there, heard it, and said it thundered, because the voice of God thunders. But others said an angel had spoken to him. Verse 30, here it comes. Jesus said, this voice, God's voice, was for your benefit, not mine. I already know this. Now, the time for judgment, the time, not the instant, but the interval. Not the instant, but the span of time, the era, as it were. For judgment on this world, it's now come. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. Well, Satan is clearly still here, so this is the era in which it's going to happen. But he's still going to rule and reign. He's the prince of this world. Who called him that? Jesus. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to myself. One more, John 16. Just turn over a few pages. John wrote this. John, who wrote the book of Revelation, just wrote what you just read and wrote this too. Wrote the book of Revelation. God told him to write it down. Verse 16, verse, uh, chapter 16, verse 8. When the Holy Spirit comes, he will convict the world of guilt in regard to sin and righteousness and judgment. In regard to sin... Because men do not believe in me. In regard to righteousness, because I am going to the Father, where you can see me no longer. And in regard to judgment, because the prince of this world now stands condemned. He, his doom is certain. This is Satan, and Satan is doomed. But he's still the prince of this world. He still rules this place. Now, back to Revelation. I know, you're turning a lot of pages here. Bear with me, but it's worth the trip. Verse 6. Then I saw a lamb, looking as if it had been slain, standing in the center of the throne, encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. And he had seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. The lamb steps forward. Okay, who's the lamb? Jesus. Looking like it has been slain. In what manner? Passover. Now, Jesus was the Passover lamb. The New Testament attests to this. Jesus attested to it. When you partake of communion, you're reminded of that. Going to the cross, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. He causes death, or in our case, damnation, to pass over us. In other words, we have applied his blood. We talk about the blood of Jesus. That's Christianese. Somebody who doesn't know Jesus Christ or has never read the Bible, if you come up to that person and say, have you been washed in the blood, they're going to run the other way because they're not going to understand the statement. We are under the blood. How so? Like the Passover where you had to take a lamb, sacrifice it, dip hyssop, which is a weed like an herb, and put it across the lintel and the doorposts of your house. Hmm, funny, it makes a cross shape kind of thing, doesn't it? But if you're inside the house, you are safe from the angel of death. He will pass over. And Jesus is the lamb who causes death, eternal death, damnation, to pass over us. But you've got to be in the house with the blood on it. This is the lamb who was slain. It's a picture of Jesus being the ultimate Passover lamb who causes death and hell, as it were, to pass over us, to not affect us if you're in the house. You can't be standing out in the street and looking at the blood. Picture the Egyptians where this happened as the last plague of, the, of Egypt. If you haven't ever read it, well, then watch the movie The Ten Commandments. I don't care, but you'll see it there. If you weren't inside the house and you were a firstborn... You were dead. That was it. So Jesus is like the Passover lamb. He's expecting, John is expecting to see a lion, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the Messiah standing there in all his glory. Well, he already saw that in chapter 1. Now he sees Jesus looking like a lamb that was slain, the Passover lamb. And the Passover speaks of Jesus on the cross, 
so you can see the, the very, very visual picture God is giving us of this is what salvation looks like. Enter the house, you're safe. Because the blood is on the door. You are now under the blood. Makes sense. It's not Christianese anymore, is it? It's a picture. And he's got seven horns. That's perfect authority. We talked about the horns. Seven eyes. Where does that come from? Well, it actually comes out of Zechariah. In, the, in Zechariah, uh, it's a long passage. You can read it yourself, but if you're taking notes, read Zechariah chapter 4, where we've already read part of it when we're describing what was happening in Revelation chapter 4. They correspond. Where, John, where Zechariah said, I, he was asked, what do you see? I see a gold lamp, solid gold lampstand with bowls at the top, seven lights on it. Well, that's you know, like what we see in heaven there in chapter 4. We, you've read it again. If you haven't read it, read up on it. It's right there. It's in, in writing. And, um, uh, and, and the Lord speaking to Zechariah finally says, uh, verse 10, Who despises the day of small things? Men will rejoice when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. Okay, well, what's the deal with that? It's just a little thing talking about one of the priests in those days, the high priest. But then he says about the eyes, the seven lampstands, the, the, uh, the Spirit of God, as it were. These are the seven, these seven, or the seven lamps that are burning. Am I being clear on this? Let's go back. Think, think of the menorah, these seven lamps that are burning. These are the eyes of the Lord. They're, it's light. Right? It's lit up. You know, we don't have the thing lit up, of course. It's just a little you know, candelabra back there. But these, he said, what does this mean? When you see a menorah, especially when it's lit, these are the eyes of the Lord, which range throughout the earth. Jesus has the seven eyes. And this, of course, the eyes of the Lord, range throughout the whole earth. Jesus sees everything. Jesus has the seven horns, God's total authority. So where is all of this going? I've given you lots of bits and pieces, but let's kind of take this a little bit further now. You have Jesus. He's got the seven horns. He's got the eyes. And he came and took the scroll, verse 7 in Revelation 5, from the right hand of him who sat on the throne. He goes and he takes it from the hand of his father. And when he had taken it, the four living creatures and 24 elders fell down before the Lamb, before Jesus. And each one had a harp, and they were holding golden bowls full of incense, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sang a new song, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain. And with your blood you purchased men for God. You can see the picture of Passover in there with the cross. And you purchased men for God from every tribe, language, and people, and nation, not just the Jews from everywhere. And you have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. This scroll, what is it? There's a place about nine miles north of Jericho, it's a valley. It's uninhabited, and it's called Wadi Dalia. Wadi Dalia. And in that Wadi, some Bedouins back in, 19, in the 1960s found a cave. They looted the cave, and they found some artifacts, and they put them on the open market. Some archaeologists found the artifacts, bought them up, discovered who the Bedouins were, went back to them and said, can you show us the cave? They did. Of course, archaeologists, being what they were, went inside the cave and started to dig. And when they did, this is what they found. Coins and two gold rings, papyri, along with stamp seals, some intact and, woo, various human remains. These were attributed to Samaritans who had fled from Alexander the Great in 331 B.C., that's a long time ago, before Christ. The archaeologists discovered 18 partially legible, listen, 18 partially legible Aramaic legal papyri, scrolls, and clay seals inscriptions from the 4th century before Jesus, during the reign of Artaxerxes and Artaxerxes II. 
These were excavated in 1963, and the papyri are now housed in the Rockefeller Museum in Jerusalem. The contents of the documents include the deeds for the sale of slaves. And if you see one of these scrolls, it was a deed that said, I own the slave. It has seven seals written on the outside and the stipulations on the inside are all the details about the slave. On the outside, it tells you who the legal owner is. If the legal owner dies, that deed has to go to a family member who meets the qualifications to open the scroll and claim the slave. Now, I have something. This is not papyrus, this is parchment. This is a family heirloom. All this says on the outside here is United States to George Howard, and then it was recorded April 14th, 1847, and recorded May 14th, 1847 uh, um, here as well. It's written on the outside, who owns this? When this is passed down, they have to be related somehow to George Howard, which somehow I am related to George Howard. That's how it came into my possession. And when you open it up, this is not a scroll, it's parchment. But you have this. This is a land grant for somewhere in downtown Cincinnati, which has since gone over to many different owners, and I don't own downtown Cincinnati. But it's got a seal here on the inside, not on the outside, and it's signed here by John Quincy Adams. That's his signature. So it was quite a legal document. But there are other signatures on here that had to have been witnessed, these signatures. What you have is this is a more modern version, as old as it is, to something like I just described that they found in this Wadi, Wadi Dalia, nine miles north of Jericho. There have been other scrolls that have been found, but this is one that I choose to just kind of mention because it had to do with slaves. Other scrolls exactly of the same nature with seven seals, they were for defaulted land. Now, each seal represents a different witness. Sealed with a clay seal or perhaps a form of wax in those days. And when you roll up the scroll with the stipulations, this is the deed. You know what's in deeds. Most of you own a house. If you owned a person in the days of slavery, it would be the same sort of thing. The person is your personal property. And it's all written out and then you roll it up and then the witnesses that say, yes, you are the legal owner of the property or of the person, then the witnesses come forward and this scroll is sealed along the edge with all of these seals, each one being a legal witness. If the scroll, the deed, goes into default, you have an example of that that I've already mentioned a couple of weeks ago, actually three weeks ago, that you're going to have to read on your own because it's too long to deal with here today. We'll never get out of this room. The book of Ruth. And I mentioned to you that Ruth was born into a family where not only her mother's husband, her father, had died, but Ruth was married to another man who had also died, and they had moved from Bethlehem where they owned property, this family, along with Naomi and Ruth and the other sister, and they moved over to Moab, which is across the Jordan River Valley on the plateaus over by Ammon, Jordan. It's over on that side. And there... They owned this property over on the other side, but because the husbands had died, the women were not entitled to own the property. So the scroll, the deed to the property near Bethlehem, goes into default. And as it sits there with the family, the property just lays there fallow. The rest of the story about Ruth is her falling in love with a very wealthy man named Boaz. Boaz wants to marry Ruth. But Ruth, because of the way things worked back in those days, unfair, but that's the way it was, Ruth was part of the land property that had gone into default. And only a family member was entitled to take that property back based on the stipulations on the outside of a scroll sealed with seals. 
which would have been the deed back in those days, something like that. Well, Boaz wants Ruth. So he hatches an idea. He goes back to Bethlehem. And he's there in Bethlehem. And while he's there, the challenge comes forth to an elder, I want to buy the land. Well, you can't buy the land. It's not entitled to you. The kinsman redeemer, in other words, the relative who can redeem the property, who actually fits the qualifications written on the outside of the scroll of the deed there. It's written there. He can take the deed if he wants it. And he says, I want it in front of the elders at the gate. The elders who ratify legal transactions. They're witnesses, professional witnesses. And this person comes forward and says, I want the land. Boaz says, did you know that the land also comes with Ruth? You have to take her as a secondary wife. Well, then I don't want the land. Boaz breathes a big sigh of relief, and he takes the defaulted property and purchases it. Now he owns the property, and he gets the bride that comes with the property. Is this starting to sound a little familiar to you? And that's in the book of Ruth. What's happened here is that Satan owns the earth. It's been defaulted into his authority. The Bible, I have told you today, and there are more verses on it, that's just the first collection of them, makes it very clear. He owns the earth. God is in charge of everything, but God allows this legal transaction. God is the God of truth. God is the God of truth making sure that everything is perfect because he is perfect. Satan has the deed. The question now is, since man who was given the deed has given the deed of the earth, or humanity for that matter, over to the devil, how do you get it back? It's got to be bought back. And it's got to be bought back by a kin, by somebody who's related to the original owners. God became man and lived for a little while among us. Emmanuel, God with us. God became human in the form of Jesus Christ and died and rose never to die again and lives. Who can take the scroll out of default now? Jesus because he paid the price. And he is human. All God, but all human. Again, I can't explain that, but that's what the Bible tells us. And being that all human part, it means that he's part of the family of man. And therefore, he is suing to get the deed back. But no one was found on heaven or on earth or under the earth to open the scroll. And the angel says, don't weep, John. He's sobbing uncontrollably for the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed. And he sees a lamb as if it had been slain with seven horns, absolute authority, seven eyes. I see everything. I got it all down. And he takes the scroll from the hand of the one who sits on the throne. And what do the elders do? The elders who are the witnesses of legal transactions, they fall down and they say, you are worthy to take the scroll. That is a legal statement. That's a statement that says, you have fulfilled the qualifications and we are witnesses. And they worship because now Jesus is going to take back the earth for himself, for his people, for us. He's about to do that in this passage of Scripture. You are worthy to take the scroll, verse 9. They sing this. I wonder what it sounds like. Because you were slain, and with your blood, now let, put all the pieces together in your head, with your blood you purchased men for God, from every tribe, language, people, and nation, the whole world that Satan has up to this point held sway and held authority. You have made them to be a kingdom 
and priests to serve God. And they will reign on earth, not the devil, not the evil one, not the liar, not the accuser, not Satan. They will reign on earth. And then John said, verse 11, I looked and I heard the voice of many angels numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. And in a loud voice they sang, they agreed with the elders, worthy is the lamb who was slain to receive power. You get it all back. Wealth, all the wealth of the world that Satan promised to Jesus. No, no, he gets it legally. He doesn't have to be tempted to do it. He's going to get it anyway because He's going to get it back. He's worthy and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. He's the one. He is worthy. The elders say this. All the witnesses in heaven say this. You know when you've been there like, like uh, to, to your wedding, right? That we had every, you guys came to the wedding. Every time that these two made a vow to each other, all the witnesses shout. Amen. See, you still remember. And that's what they're doing. They're singing, they're praising, but this is their amen. We are witnesses that Jesus is worthy to take the scroll back from Satan, take the earth back from his dominion, and rule and reign on it for as long as he chooses it to last. And then, verse 13, I heard every living, every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them singing to him who sits on the throne, God, and to the Lamb, Jesus be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. And the four living creatures said, Amen. And all the elders fell down and worshipped. Now do you get it? What's happened here is the deed to the earth or even the deed to humanity being made slaves to sin, slaves to the enemy. But the deed to the earth itself and all that comes with it has now been handed to Jesus who said, I meet every qualification to open this scroll and all the elders and all the witnesses of heaven say, yes, you are worthy to do this. It is legal. It is binding. You are the one. You paid the price just the way Boaz paid the price for the land to get Ruth. You paid the price to get every person, tribe on the earth, all who would ever come. The gavel has dropped. The transaction has been witnessed and found legal in the holy presence of God who can never lie and never do anything contrary to his holy nature. And it is also in the end witnessed by the uncountable assembly of the angels surrounding the throne of God. And with that, boom, the gavel drops. And the very next verse that you read in chapter 6, verse 1, I watched as the Lamb opened the first of the seven seals. The end of the world has now begun. And that's where we pick it up next time. Father, thank you for what you are going to do and showing us how this works and making it so simple to us that this is what you're going to do and why. And it clarifies to us, Lord, through all the tangle of all the theologies that are out there taught by people who just never bothered to read the Old Testament, just how clear it is of what you are doing and why you are doing it and what gives you the right and the authority to do it, to which we say you are worthy. You are worthy, along with the angels, along with the elders, along with the cherubim. And Lord... We ask that you would speed the day where you do this thing in heaven so that we would have you as the ruler of this earth and we would rule and reign with you, whatever that looks like. But Lord, thank you that you will take it all back, that as messy as the world is and as messier it's going to get, that someday under your absolute authority and final authority, you will set all things right. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.